At the start of World War II, the main armament in tanks was basically a 37 millimeter round. This is an American, and that's a two pounder British. Now, some tanks, the Americans had them in their Grants and the French had them in their Char B, I think, had a 75 mil round, but that was not very common. The Germans had a 37 as well, and they also had a 50 mil round. But as you can see, these are just blunt force punching their way through armour plate. So they had to come up with better ideas as the tank's armour got thicker and thicker. An effect which basically started out called the Munro effect. An American designer in the late 1880s came across this effect by using a shaped charge of explosive. It focused the direction of the charge into one point causing more damage and, and deeper impact. This is a good example on a uh, US anti-tank rifle, grenade. The shape here is called a cone. And behind the cone is the explosives. As this is detonated, an impact fuse comes through, sets it off, and it focuses all that energy into one point, and that'll burn a hole through armor. The British also had a similar design in the, in the form of their number 68 anti-tank rifle grenade. This is fired from a cup discharger off a 303 rifle. Once again, you can see the cone shape, the cavity for the uh, explosives. The British also went on to make the pit. And same thing, inside here is a cone shaped charge behind it, and basically could punch through most German tanks early in the war. Germans started the war with an anti-personnel grenade fired from the K98 rifle. Just basically fits in there fires at, that's anti-personnel. Then they went on to develop a 30 millimeter anti-tank and then the 40 mil anti-tank. All fired from the same discharger. Once again, you can see the cone shape there. The yellow would be the explosive filling and the base of the cone there. The Germans came up with a nifty little cheap, easy to make item called a Panzerfaust. And this is the Klein, the small one. These fins fold up and go inside the tube. Gives a bit of stability to the flight. The trouble is Russians kept building bigger tanks, bigger and thicker, so. So what was the answer to that? The answer to that was make a bigger one. This is the next size up. Once again, cone shape, explosive filling in here. To make this work properly, you need to have what's called standoff. So that there's enough time for the energy of the explosives to build up to burn its hole through the armor. This is the next model along. You can tell the difference because this is the early style sighting and arming. The later styles is basically the same tube, same warhead, but with a different mechanism. They had a little nib on top of the projectile, and that's how you got lined up with those sights there. Once again, the folding fins. The Germans were producing a little anti-tank gun that fired an 88 millimeter projectile similar to this. And then what happened in late 43, they captured some American bazooka rockets in Tunisia. And they captured the bazooka as well. So they had a good look at the bazooka and thought we can make something similar. They already had an 88 millimeter rocket that they'd already produced. So they decided to make something what's called the Panzer Shrek. The projectile is loaded from the rear. It's not a tight fit, it's only running on three recesses here. A little connector's put to the propellant, and then it uses a little magneto-type firing mechanism. At the start of World War II, most German anti-tank guns were 37 mil. 37 mil guns became obsolete, but instead of wasting them, the Germans actually recycled them and then produced these to go on them. These are a Stelgranat 41, and basically, it's fired from the 37 mil pack gun. Blank cartridge this size, the standard size round for this gun, and just fired a blank. This round, you can see one we've already got mounted to the gun here. This spigot here is 37 mil di diameter. It just slides on the barrel. That's how easy it was to load. Slide it on, load a blank, and you're ready to go. This would take out T-34s, not a problem. It gave the infantry a little bit of confidence that they can handle tank attacks if they had to. This is a three kilogram German magnetic anti-tank charge. The Germans invented these in around about 42. And the idea was that a man could uh, wait for the tanks to get close, run out, take the protective cover off, and then mount it 
with the three magnets to a tank, pull the fuse, hopefully have enough time to get away. And as we've been speaking about, once again, it has the hollow charge, the cone. This distance here is a standoff. And that would just burn a hole straight through Russian armor. Because the Germans invented this magnetic mine, they figured other countries would do the same. So they had to come up with a way that this wouldn't be effective against their own tanks. And they came up with a thing called Zimmerit paste. This is a beautiful front glacier plate of a panther. If you look closely, you can see these approximately three inch squares. That's still remnants of where the, the Zimmerit was placed. Here I am beside the uh, museum's wonderful panther. And as you can see, we have this coating here, which replicates the Zimmerit coating that would have been used in World War II. If the Russians had captured any of these, and they did, and they used them against these tanks, they wouldn't be effective because they wouldn't stick. That's basically what the paste was for. On the Mark I Tigers, the early Tigers, the first couple of hundred, they've got what look like smoke discharges three either side of their turrets. They're actually an anti-personnel mine, similar to the S mine here. If the tank's about to be overrun by the enemy infantry, they're able to fire these individually or, or all together and they'll jump up in the air and then throw out a heap of shrapnel like this. Another way to destroy the enemy tanks is to use landmines. And what we have here is a fairly good selection of landmines from the museum's collection. It's set off by pressure, a pressure fuse. So basically what you have on the top is a massive big pressure plate. This just unscrews. You'd insert the fuse, that's the fuse. You can see the spring holding it off. So once the pressure plate pushes down, that plunger goes down, hits a little detonator, and then all this is explosive filling. That's enough to damage a tank track, or if it's a uh, half track, to, to blow it completely up. These ones here are Drucks under 35s. Uh, as you can see, there's a nice little section one here. I'll try and get him out. Once again, they just work on pressure. You've got a big area here for the pressure, a spring down to a little uh, primer detonator, and then the main charge will be underneath. What we have here is a Regal mine. These come in late in the war, and they're basically an early style bar mine. You can see the size of the, um, the mines here and the pressure plate. The tank had to get pretty close or drive right over that. Whereas this bar mine, you could lay across the road and have better chance of a tank running over it. It sits up on a spring, so you push down anywhere here, you only have to clip the edge of this and it'll set it all off. The final thing we're gonna show is the Germans had a way of disabling their own weapons in case they were about to be captured. And this is a little charge. This fits in a 50 mil barrel. They had them for 75s, 37 mil. And basically, unfortunately, this is a bit of a relic, but you take the lid off and there's the fuse and the, uh, the charge. It could be placed down the barrel of the tank, and set it off, run away, and then that would destroy the tank barrel so it couldn't be used against you.